Okay, we're back. So everyone can keep working on their art during this final, final part of the AGM. Um, I think it'll be really insightful context for the questions that we're considering tonight on the panel. I'd like to now welcome um, Sheldemar, um, who to the virtual mic, who's going to be our host for this last part of tonight's event. Sheldemar, to you. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, Hansel. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sheldemar. Uh, you see him pronouns, and I'm the Supportive Partnerships Platform Coordinator at FoodShare. Um, all of our guests tonight are part of the Supportive Partnerships Platform community, which means that they're a part of incredible grassroots and community-driven organizations that are doing important work in their communities. Uh, from our side, FoodShare provides these groups with administrative support around finance, human resources, and operations, and anything else that involves coming alongside and championing their work. Uh, so I can already tell you that you're going to wish that we had more time to speak with these incredible folks. And just in the interest of time, and because my colleagues on the communications team and I just couldn't bear shortening these folks' bios because they're doing so much vital and important work, uh, I'm just going to tell them, I'm going to tell you who they are and uh, which group that they're representing by way of introduction, but uh, we will share their detailed bios in the Eventbrite for this event, and we'll be putting their detailed bios in the chat for you to take a look at afterward. Um, so thank you, and I'd like to invite the uh, panel up, if that's okay. Wonderful. I think we have two more coming. And uh, I will just jump into the prompt. And before I ask, actually, no, I, I think it makes sense, like match names to groups. Um, so as we wait for the last person to jump in, I'll just uh, briefly mention that we have Jennifer Scott here, who is from Foodsters United. Uh, we have Liz from Vivimos Yuntix. Comimos Yuntix, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, we have Michelle from Thorncliffe Park uh, Urban Farmers, uh, Shabina from Seed Soil Spirit School, and I believe we have Laura joining us from Birch Mount Community Action Council. Um, just someone, if you can find her and add her here, that'd be great too. So uh, for today, you know, so much of these last few months in our city has been framed around the imminent mayoral election. And I know a lot of us struggle with the complicated nature of often wanting to reject electoral politics and the whole rotten political system together and recognizing that there is an opportunity for often sometimes incremental change and engaging with institutional change through city politics. I was initially planning on asking a really specific question about what you'd like to tell the new mayor of Toronto. And by all means, once we get into conversation, let it rip. Please tell us what you feel. Uh, but as I think we've all been surrounded by messaging around this election and the stakes involved, I think instead of it, it would be great as, as you're answering questions today, that you can consider what role city government and structures like it have, whether that's support or simply getting out of the way of community-led initiatives and activism like the work you folks are already doing. And really just overall, what role each of us play in manifesting the Toronto we want. So we see, sorry, I just want to take a moment here. Is Laura present? Here we are. Great, great to see you, Laura. So, um, you know, over the last year, as part of our Right to Food campaign, FoodShare has been posing a question at events and online, asking what their community, like Hans was tonight, and life would look like if they had the right to food was realized. And by the way, if folks haven't checked it out already, uh, you can look at this expedition, ex exhibition, wow, words, um, online at realized-reimagined.net. And you can see incredible art there. But in response to the prompt, imagine a future where we can all access food in the ways we want. What does it look like? And what does it feel like? And some of the responses that we got back from folks were really great. Uh, people were saying things like reducing the miles that our food has to travel. People can grow their own food on a balcony, roof, or in a garden teaching people how to harness and collect rainwater, how to collect seeds, seeds are life, uh, teaching people about community kitchens and gardens, food forests, gathering to eat together at all times of the day. 
um, and having a loving relationship with culturally relevant foods and our bodies. And lastly, but probably most important, land back. So it struck me in seeing and hearing these responses that what we're working toward when it comes to achieving food justice and ultimately food sovereignty is not anything new. And yet there is something about seeking old ways of knowing and being of returning to the way we always have grown and prepared and shared food that feels downright revolutionary. So I'm curious to hear from folks here. What are the ways that you're seeing that returning happening in your life, family, community, and work? And um, I don't want to point to one person, so I'd like to just open it up to whomever might have thoughts. Um, but if I sense there's muting, then I'll just I'll I'll call on someone. I mean, uh, I can go. Uh, thank you, okay. Sabina. Yeah, go for it. Thank Thanks you so much, Lamar, for putting all together this this amazing panel. And I guess for us, like I, I'm one of the directors over at Seed Soul Spirit. Um, we're a grassroots organization, really working with plant medicine knowledge uh, for the most part and land stewardship. And you know, a huge thing that we find is that a lot of our knowledge has sort of been coded into culture. Right, you know, through the process of colonization, so much of our systems of science and stewardship have been sort of forced underground in, in some ways. And so, you know, a lot of what is like a very scientific approach is actually so woven into the ways of being that we have. Um, and, you know, a lot of the work that we do with students is collectively realizing that like so much of the wisdom we hold is is embedded into that and in a lot of ways seen as like auntie knowledge or like you know like grandma knowledge and I think um sometimes undervalued in that sense and you know I think there is this like returning and realizing that you know as systems western systems catch up to indigenous knowledge that there's so much value in it and there's so much depth to it so for me that that is the returning the affirmation of of our knowledge and knowledge systems and it's so beautiful to see uh, you know we host a lot of a lot of different students from backgrounds like primarily from black indigenous and racialized communities and just the process of affirmation is is an absolutely beautiful full circle experience for so many of our students so that's definitely how i see that yeah thank you for sharing i could just imagine the reception amongst youth like learning all of this stuff uh, must be powerful what are other people's thoughts here Definitely just echoing what Shabina was saying. Um, I know for us at Birchmount, we are so happy to, you know, have some funding where we get to actually model what returning looks like for us. Um, having our elders working hand in hand with our youth and, you know, just providing them with that context and knowledge. Because if you didn't grow back, grow up in a back home, then, you know, there's a lot of disconnect to what our food systems were. Right, you may hear about it, but what does it mean in practice? And you know, just to hear some of the things that our young people are sharing about their gratefulness of the learnings that are you know being shared with them, it's it's really great. Um, but most importantly, I would say, um, when it comes to this whole piece of like land stewardship and not actually having access to land that you can pass down as a legacy, I feel like that's a huge hindrance right that's one thing to get things going but when you're looking at sustainability you're always still asking for permission without having that regard so we're really looking for a, a way for us to um, work coll collaboratively to ensure that we can hone in on what that means for legacy building for sustainability um, because for, for me, I come from a household where I still hear the stories of the Aki tree in the front yard and all of the, the loveliness of having food right at your fingertips. Although in, in the back of their mind, they also thought that they were living um, somewhat of an impoverished life and that, you know, the golden light would be migrating to Canada. And now coming into the knowledge and the time that, you know, health is well. Um, it's, uh, I think it's really important for us to secure uh, spaces where not just community can own, but culturally specific relevant collaborations 
to ensure that, you know, our types of foods are grown to nourish our bodies. Yeah. I love what you shared there, Laura. I was actually at an event today. Um, I won't get into it all, but that idea of food being our medicine came up. And I don't think many people in the room were familiar with this quote, um, but it resonated with me, it resonated with a bunch of others. And I think you also mentioned something really important there is like that intergenerational knowing and sharing of knowledge. Another food share event last week, uh, shout out to the International Public Markets Conference. Um, there was a similar panel and um, we had someone by the name of Jesse from David's Market in Birchmount sharing a similar uh, sentiment about like the importance of having youth and elders work together. Um, there's something really rich about that and just like brings together the human essence of connecting and spirit and whatnot. Um, yeah, I, I'm answering. So let me just throw it back to the panelists here. How about others? Liz, Jennifer, Michelle, any thoughts? Michelle, please. I think my comments are going to touch base with uh, the previous two speakers as well. Um, from So I'm in Thorncliffe Park and we run communal gardens. Um, and I was in the garden hosting a, a workshop uh, a couple of weeks back and there was about 10 of us in the gardens, a lot of fathers with their daughters by chance. And I posed the question, you know, how many of us come from families that were growing food back home? Back home seems to be a big topic, but to my surprise, none of us did. Um, and we all come from a very diverse background. So I do recognize that it's more of, you know, my generation's grandparents that were doing these things and not so much our parents. So over these generations, we are, we are experiencing this disconnect in our, in our food system. But now because of awareness, we have these parents that are from our generation wanting to teach their children these skills. What I notice is that a lot of people feel lost. They don't know how. They don't know how to connect to the food system. They feel that they're not a part of it anymore. So I think spaces like all of our grassroots organizations help from the bottom up. It helps reconnect people back into these spaces and to get that, yes, I can. I can be a part of this change, you know, but they definitely need people like us to also like help guide them and to encourage them and to provide that leadership and education. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, it, it could be daunting, I imagine, for people who are not familiar. Um, and it's funny you say that too, like I, maybe I'm, I don't want to talk too much because I know it's, we have a short amount of time, hence the preface of saying, I wish we had more time. But um, similarly, like it was for me specifically, I learned my appreciation with food through spending time with my grandmother in her garden as a young child. Um, and my mom didn't necessarily pick up on that, but it was after I kind of re-sparked that interest of mine and my adult years, she is now interested in growing food. So it's interesting how like generations can influence each other and the other way around. I think that was the push of the times, you know, right. like that was the push to like get women back into the workforce, you know, get into the, use the grocery store, you know, buy food that's pre-cut up. And, you know, that was the push of our governments and our society to to create that disconnect, but we're now becoming aware that that is not how we want to be living. Yeah, snaps for that. That's real. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Jennifer, Liz, any thoughts on this? I kind of wanted to bring up the fact that food sharing was actually how Vivimos Juntos, Comemos Juntos, We Eat Together, We Live Together started. This was a night to invite undocumented and formerly undocumented migrants to share a meal in order to share knowledge that we had accumulated throughout the years or months living in Canada. And this was really cathartic for a lot of people because not only are you having the ability to make connections with one another, with folks who are in your same situation, with dealing with precarious immigration status, but you're also making the connection of sharing a meal because food doesn't have borders. Food transpires in so many different ways. And even if you cook a similar thing from your country, maybe another person cooks like a very similar thing. So this was a really great way to get together and to get to know the community. And this is actually how a lot of our projects started. This is how the um, Undocumented Resilience, which is a project that we did regarding 
excuse me, financial resistance when undocumented, which allowed us to connect with undocumented migrant workers and how they survived, uh, quote unquote, Toronto. Um, this was a way for them to gain income and buy proper food for their families because being undocumented, sometimes you don't have access to food banks or you don't meet the requirements when it comes to documentation or uh, immigration status. And we also wanted to challenge the idea of the capitalistic mindset. We have a very anti-capitalistic, anti-colonial mindset where we invite folks to understand that although we came to Canada through a very colonial immigration system, it is still a responsibility to build meaningful connections with the land that we inhabit. Because a lot of us are indigenous to places back home, and now it's our turn to respect the same treaties um, that indigenous people have upon the land that we live in. So it's always really nice to see how food forms the foundations for so many organizations, for, for so many communities. Absolutely. Um... You touched on so many important things there, Liz, and also just again, like, thank you everybody for your work, but especially for what you just said there, I think a lot of that work, a lot of this work is not visible, um, so I appreciate that, and I mean, for myself, I often won't go anywhere unless there's food provided, so I feel that, right, like food really is that main connector. Uh, before I jump to the next question, and unfortunately the only other question, um, I'd love to get your thoughts on this too, Jennifer. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know for anyone who doesn't know. So I'm a gig worker. So I deliver on apps like uh, Uber Eats and Skip the Dishes and members of my community do the same. And um, when I thought about this question and how I see us returning, I see us returning to each other. This, this work, you know, working on an app, um, trying to make enough money on an app, you know, is is very isolating, and a big part of the um, narrative that apps have sold, um, both to customers, to workers, to members of government, um, is that nobody really needs to be connected with anybody. We don't really need each other. You know, if you order food, don't think about the people who made the food. Don't think about the people who brought you the food. You just order it on an app, and you know, here in Toronto, our people are organizing to unionize and pushing back against one of the biggest international corporations in the world, um, trying to lobby the government for aggressive labor reform. But we're also envisioning a future that looks different than the way things look now and the way they looked in the past. A future where we, the people who do the work, own the means of our labor through a worker cooperative business where we have the ability to, you know, this industry I think is meaningful and provides value to many people in our community. It is also techno feudalism. And we have the ability to challenge, to undermine and insert ourselves as the workers in that industry and begin to change the terms of how it functions. Um, and all of that exists because we come together with each other. We build mm. community, we organize, we talk with each other, and we challenge long-held beliefs and trade them for understandings and embracing ideas like collective power and super majority support from the people who do the work or the people who experience the thing which must change. Mm. Um, and so that's I see us, I see us coming to each other, which I think is really necessary. <laughs> Oh, wow. That was so powerful. Damn. I snapped to that too. And I think that's actually the perfect way to segue into the next question. But it's funny you say what you just did as you did it, Jennifer, because Andrea can attest to this. As we were coming together, thinking about this panel, um, I remember just blurting out while we were thinking about it, saying like, I was watching a YouTube video a few weeks ago, and it was an interview with this like tech bro um deep fake guy he just i don't know it was an interesting conversation i don't follow him just <laughs> put it out there um but it was an interesting conversation and something that really stuck with me that he said that frustrated me was that through all of his work and he does all this app work etc he's like i feel like i understand that humans will always pick convenience um over anything else and that kind of infuriated me and i was like okay if we are picking convenience over anything else, and it made me think about like, 
the fact that I can get food delivered to my door without having to interact with anybody. I can get my fridge fully stocked without having to talk to anybody or anything like that. It made me realize like, what are we missing if we're leaning into this convenience piece? And I think it's exactly that. It's that connection to one another and, and being here for one another. Um, so that's really powerful. And it, it really brings us into the next question. So, you know, I feel like in any conversation about the ways things need to change and to center, uh, that needs to, that for any conversation where we're talking about things changing, we need to center the folks who have been most marginalized in our food system. And we don't have to look far to see who's doing the hardest work, paid but also unpaid, of growing food, feeding communities, and adjusting food insecurity. It begs the question of what we have traded in exchange for convenience and capitalism, and it feels to be more like connection. <laughs> I facilitate between optimistic and pessimistic about our ability to revalue the knowledge and labor of food workers of all kinds, be they migrant workers, farmers, delivery folks, etc., at all points in the food system. We have collectively lost so much of our humanity in this. So is that reconnection even possible? And that's, of course it is. But I guess the idea instead of asking that is, you know, what's needed to make that reconnection happen on a larger scale? We're thinking about Toronto in this case. Um, and maybe Jennifer, I can just throw that right back to you. Like, concerning this is something you think about, like what, what do we need more of? Oh, good. Tech. Something with the mic. Can't unmute. Okay. Uh, do we have a... Got it. Great. Thanks for the help. Um, Sorry, before you continue, the interpreter, the other interpreter can't turn her camera on either. If we could just adjust that so we can do a, a quick switch before you answer the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Peter. Awesome. Thanks. Or Jenny. This question reminded me of a conversation that I had with someone and we were talking about organizing. My answer to this question is organizing. Um, <laughs> but we were talking about why people organize and what value people get from organizing and she you know much more eloquently than i can described this really beautiful scenario that still exists in my mind um, and this idea that each of us are on our own path but that our paths connect with each other and each of us has different things to learn along the way as we walk that path but we do all walk it together um, and when I think about us reconnecting and building connections with people who work with food, the way that we do that is through organizing. Because I think that when we organize and we work to find common ground with each other, collectively dream about or envision a different future and what it could look like, and then make plans and take action to win them as small as the winds might be in the beginning, through doing that work and doing that work together with others, through working collectively to complete a task or to plan an event, to pull off a project, through doing the, the work, we think by being side by side with each other in that struggle, we learn about each other and we grow. And I think I'm certain we become better humans. We see each other more clearly, I think, and we find our humanity in each other and as we grow in ourselves. Organizing definitely is about achieving a goal, but I think more importantly, it's about connecting with each other and ourselves. Oh, so beautifully said. Thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. Yeah. How do others feel about this reconnecting and how do you see that show up in your work? Please, Michelle. So I'm going to take the more pessimist type of view, but like a lot of people in my neighborhood, you know, I also feel that sense of hopeless, you know, 
Um, a lot of us economically were just struggling. And again, like our society has created this system for individualism. And you quite often hear, um, you know, especially newcomers are very lonely. You know, there's a lot of isolation. And when there's such despair between our society, it's really hard to find ways to, to change and to feel connected to each other, right? And then when we have a government that feels that is not connected to us, you feel like, where are you gonna go? You know, so on a larger scale, like the reality is like, it is super challenging to create large scale change, you know, from the bottom up. So, <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then on the other flip side, like we have we have a generation of farmers. We have more farmers that are over the age of 65 that are retiring compared to farmers under the age of 45. So it's in a way it's a dying industry. And you know, we have you know developers wanting to grow onto their, you know, on their farmland. And these farmers are also inheriting like massive of acres of, of land that they can't, they can't manage so it, we're at a point where like realistically ai is going to be farming for our commercial farmers you know so i i think it's very difficult to create change and uh, you know you mentioned our our terrible uh election but the problem is like we leadership is essential you know like we need leadership to to run our societies but we need to vote in the right people to be our leaders and to actually you know think about how we utilize change so leadership is essential so and then just again like just keep doing what we do um and just try to keep encouraging and educating people and yeah that's my opinion Thank you for your opinion. I, I hear you in saying that you want to take the pessimistic approach, but I think it's still slightly optimistic. And I hear a bit of like that, you know, so going for the small things, the small goals that we can go for. Um, and uh, the farmers aging out, that's a really important thing. I, I know that's a bigger conversation that's happening. Again, at the Food Share Conference last week, or event last week, um, someone brought this up to the panel. And I forget who, but someone answered saying that maybe we need to add more curriculum around agriculture into schools to sort of like demystify land work and um, encourage young people to like consider that as a viable pathway. Um, I'm all in. I don't know what that looks like, but I hear you in saying that it's not an easy sell. And like as a young person myself telling other people that I'm a farmer, um, yeah, people <laughs> usually like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not down for that. And um, maybe there's some more stigma to be brought um sorry if there's barking in the back just dogs going a little wild um how do others feel about this reconnection what does that look like i mean i personally love the idea of the curriculum that would explain how farming works in ontario or all over canada and i think that it should also be said which land is being used for cultivation where the land was taken where it was stolen often but also to talk about who are the bodies that are working those farms, right? Who are the migrant workers who are growing your food and feeding farmers? Because I know that the Western family is not out in the fields with mm -hmm. the bad air quality out there. They're not the ones who are laboring. It's migrant workers, it's racialized folks who are doing the really hard work. Um, and I think that talking about those topics and bringing them to discourse or mainstream discourse or talks with your family as in saying it's not Canadian farmers it's people who are being taken advantage of who often become undocumented who are in risk of deportation because if their employer doesn't like the way that they're fighting for basic human rights uh, they could be sent back to their home countries which is really really sad um, but I also wanted to share this idea that BJCJ asked is that we're not going to ask 
the government to do things for us. We are going to organize and create these safe spaces for us because we know, we know what we need. We know the kind of spaces we need. And to have those connections with not only undocumented folks, but with other migrant led groups, with other grassroots organizations, with other indigenous folks who are from this territory or from other territories around the world is so meaningful mm -hmm. because this method of knowledge sharing is what is going to get us through, is what is going to be revolutionary um building relationships with the land and with the folks that you're living with is revolutionary in itself because it brings you out of isolation and it tells you that you belong you know mm -hmm. uh, and my migratory status should not be based on a document but in the relationships that you have with the people who you live with mm -hmm. so i think that's my thoughts on that yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you no talk about it that's that's all there um shabina i want to throw it to you but jennifer i i saw when liz said organizing yeah, you got some. You sure you don't want to just chime in real quick? We we are a little short, but I, I have to give you the opportunity. I was trying to set off all like the fire emojis and be like, "Yeah." <laughs> there we go. We got a collab coming soon, right here. <laughs> um, Shabina, not to put you uh, on like the pressure, but please no, you're good. feel free. You're good. I guess for me, like you know, I grew up. Um, in the restaurant industry my family came over as refugees and that's kind of where everybody landed right and um you know there's always this dynamic of all the racialized folks who are actually making the food in the back and hiring white waitresses for the front because nobody wants to interact with us right <laughs> um you know and I think for me, that informed my understanding of a lot of the world, right? It's, it's not necessarily what you're doing or how much you know, it's how you present <laughs> and how people recognize how you say it. And that's the world we live in. Um, that's determined by so many things, white supremacy, even academia at this point, right? I mean, I remember uh, being asked to speak at a conference where people were asking um academics to speak about migrant workers and when we had suggested actually workers who were organizing to come and speak the answer was no and that's 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 just the reality right and to me you know I think in our work at the school what I've learned is that for a lot of us this is times of prophecy right we're told this is the moment where people from across the world are coming together and our sacred responsibility is to be able to figure it out. Um, and to me, I can try to beg people to care <laughs> about people who are brutalized by this system, but the reality is that feels a lot like wasting time. Mm. To me, the responsibility that I have, and I think a lot of people um, in our courses can relate, is about building a common understanding and a respect with one another. Um, you know, there's so much push in terms of being accepted a lot of the time, which I understand, but at the same time, the reality is um, there's a lot of disdain between our communities for a lot of real reasons. So figuring out how to work with each other and to see where we overlap and, you know, how to build that solidarity um, is really the important thing for me. Um, and I think to me, it's a lot about humbling and listening and being uncomfortable, but that that's how we build a foundation. Um, and um, yeah, I, to me, that's, you know, we're building a, a course right now on, on, you know, ethical foraging practices and so much of that, so much of these conversations are within that around stewardship. Who has the right to steward? Of course we all do, but where's the hub, the conversation to make that happen amongst different community leaders that have historically been pitted against one another to survive, right? And um, to me, that's how we build, right? Like we have so much in common um, and that's, you know, we need to build from that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's um that's really it, the solidarity piece and organizing. Um yeah, I, what I'm hearing, I feel like a consensus amongst the group is that government is not gonna do it, so we gotta do it for ourselves, by ourselves. Um, 
hopefully we get some support because land, money, resources, those things are nice. But uh, regardless, the work will continue. And I want to say thank you to you all. You are incredible leaders. Um, just amazing work. Keep it up. Um, and thank you so much for joining me on the panel today. Um, yeah, looking forward to staying in touch. And if folks want to check out these people's work, uh, please check out their Instagram. Uh, I think there's links in the chat already, if not Eventbrite, but please support if you can um, and check it out. They're all really rad folks.